A very warm welcome to Study IQ. I am Prashant Pavani. I hope you all are doing good, my dear friends. Uh, today is Guru Nanak Jayanti, and I would like to start today's discussion with a quote by Guru Nanak Ji. He used to say, "Jaisa sevai taisa hoy." That means you become what you meditate on. If you meditate on happiness, on joy. your life becomes full of happiness and joy if you meditate on anger and sorrow then your life becomes negative so it is on us right it is totally on us uh, that's what uh, guru nanak ji is trying to tell us from this jaisa sevai taisa hoy kot with this we have many important articles to go through uh, the first article is unlawful dissolution it is about jammu and kashmir remember yesterday it was part of a news item and today we find one editorial on this particular thing now before moving ahead i would like to inform all of you that our pen drive and tablet courses which are designed by the best faculties of our nation are available for various different uh, competitive exams as you can see on your screen the good news is that uh, at present sales are going on you get flat 60% off on our pen drive and tablet courses to find out more about it do check out studyiq.com Dear friends, uh, one more thing that I'm still uh, not at my peak, or I'm not feeling that well at present. So, this is one of the main reason why today's lecture has got a little bit late, uh, an hour or something late, because I was I was feeling so dizzy this morning. But uh, since I'm getting there, right, uh, things are getting all right. But uh, still, I think it will take one or two days for me to uh, you know back uh, to be back in that state of of health. Anyways, uh, thank you very much for your well wishes. So let's uh, start our discussion on lawful dissolution. This is about Jammu and Kashmir, as uh, I have already told you guys. Now, finally, Jammu and Kashmir's governor Satyapal Malik has dissolved uh, state assembly. Now, political drama is going on in the state of Jammu and Kashmir uh, since uh, June 2018, because uh, earlier on we know that the PDP. Uh, PDP is a political party. It was uh, in coalition with BJP, and together, uh, these two parties were in power. Uh, predominantly PDP, and then it was supported by BJP. Now, in June, uh, BJP took back its support that it was providing to the PDP, and since then, we are seeing this turbulence is going on. This sort of zigzag is going on in the political life of, or this politics of. Uh, Jammu and Kashmir. Now, Governor Satyapal Malik stated reasons uh, for this dissolution. He said that uh, uh, he provided two reasons. Right, the first one is extensive horse trading. If you don't know what horse trading is all about, then it is about, you know, it is about uh, uh, using every trick in the book. May it be with the help of money. May it be with the help of muscle power. May it be with the help of talks. Right. Uh, you can use or deploy various different tactics, but uh, by doing all these things, you know, particularly by paying money or by paying, you know, you are purchasing MLAs. That's what uh, horse trading is all about. The most simple or common meaning is purchasing MLAs so that you get extra support from various different MLAs or various different political parties. and your party can come into power so let me put it this way say for example if we have a political party right uh, called abc and uh, to to form a govern a government you need to cross this bar you need to have at least minimum uh, 50 members or 50 mlas in your side if you want to form a government so let's imagine that abc has got uh, 46 MLA is at present, right? So it will need it. It has to reach fifty, isn't it, to cross this bar? So it needs uh, four more. Now imagine you have a party called X Y Z. Uh, this party has got six MLAs, but this party is totally against A B C. Uh, it will never form partnership with A B C, right? Uh, so you have other options. You have one party called Orange. You have one party called Banana. You have one party called Pineapple. So all these parties are having various different. Uh, someone is having two M L A. Someone is having three M L A. Someone is having five M L A. Etc. So depending on uh, you know how much money is required, or when I, I'm talking about pure horse trading here. 
So in this horse trading, what this ABC will do is ABC will throw some money on the table of uh, this party called Orange to purchase or to get support of two MLAs. So if it gets two MLAs, then it is at number 48. Now, if it gets uh, support of this party called uh, having five members or maybe three members, then it can easily cross this 50 uh, threshold or benchmark and then it can form government. So this is what uh, extensive horse trading is all about. I hope things are clear to you. You can form various different examples as well on horse trading. Now, the second reason that is provided by Satyapal Malik is opposing political ideologies is a big barrier. And he, as per Satyapal Singh, when you have parties uh, who are against, whose core ideology is against each other, then how can they form a government? These are the two reasons that are provided by Satyapal Singh. And the reason why he's talking about opposing political ideologies is because PDP right, uh, and CPC are, uh, are about to, you know, they are uh, planning to form a government or, you know, CPC has said that it is ready to uh, form a partnership with PDP just to protect uh, the interest of state of Jammu and Kashmir. That's what CPC has said. Now, we know, if you are not aware, then let me throw some light here. It's PDP and CPC are arch rivals. It's like BJP and Congress, you know, coming together to form a government. So this may look a bit weird. It may look a bit suspicious, isn't it? So something similar is uh, going on here in Jammu and Kashmir. Now, you will think that uh, Satyapal Malik is right. Uh, it's it's a matter of black and white, isn't it? It's quite clear that when these two parties will come in, or if they are in coalition, then it's not going to be a stable government. But if we go through, uh, if we go through the technicalities of uh, of constitution, we find that, of course, govern governor is there to use his or her discretionary power, particularly at uh, you know when when we are at this type of situation, uh, it is only during these times when when governor can execute uh, this sort of. Uh, uh, you can say discretionary powers or else governor's post is uh, more about following orders that are coming from central government. Uh, but in this sort of situation, governor will take or is allowed to take discretionary decisions. But we know that uh, for that, we have to change the whole process of appointment of governor. So until and unless we don't change the way governors are appointed and removed or transferred, Right, uh, we cannot expect uh, that sort of discretionary decision from a governor. I hope uh, things are clear to you, and I believe uh, most of you are well aware about how governors are appointed and uh, their job, their main role, etc., which is part of your basic studies, right? Part of your general studies. And if you are not aware about it, then I will reckon you guys to post this video here and open your open your reference book, may it be Lakshmi Kant or may it be from Subhas Kashyap or any other book and go through it, go through this chapter of Governor, take your time, right? May It, it may take 15-20 minutes but do spend, do invest this time and go through it and then come back to this editorial and I, I believe once you are done with that then you will understand everything because very briefly, in a nutshell, I can say that to most of the governors, right, are are political appointments uh, so if you are in a at present we know that uh, India government is running at central level so BJP leaders uh, who are who are not that good with elections or who have who have uh, done or who have uh, you know uh, contributed in the development of BJP now uh, either they are old enough or they are not that big they don't have that public face but they are good for party so you will find most of them are appointed as governors. As like we have example of uh, Mr. Vajubhai Wala uh, from Gujarat, right? So he was quite famous leader at Gujarat level, but not national level. So to just to say thank you, you know, it's it's more like a sort of uh, retirement from active politics and enjoying your uh, enjoying your life. That's what Governor Post is all about. Uh, of course, not officially. It's of course. Uh, that's this is how things are running on practical side anyways now these two reasons that are provided by governor 
is not valid at all. Supreme Court has in the past as well clearly stated this thing. And if we go through our constitution, that any two parties, right, uh, it doesn't matter. If two parties are ready to form this coalition, if they express their willingness and if they are proving this thing that yes they are ready to uh, form a government uh, then governor should not interfere and governor should uh, do everything that is possible to make sure things are back to normal rather than rejecting this sort of proposal so uh, let uh, them have a floor test right uh, and now it looks like uh, this state of uh, Jammu and Kashmir is going to have a fresh election so uh, that's a bit uh, you know strange too uh, so here we can understand that one decision of governor uh, is important and governor's post should be uh, should be up to date it should it should be you know re-engineered that's what i think because we have seen this thing many a times in the past and we are going to see this thing in future as well this sort of situation where you can uh, sort out things where you can mend things but uh, because of this uh, you know remote control in hand of uh, people who are at national level or uh, your party's top uh, brass controlling you as a governor plays you know negative role for uh, for political life of our country so i hope uh, things are clear now we're moving on to second item this is about uh, ayushman bharat it's about insurance get the model right now as per world bank report of 2015 out of pocket expense in in india is about 65 percent so that's a huge amount of money out of one lakh rupees generally speaking one on average a person will pay 65,000 rupees from his or her own pocket this is an average so you can imagine that uh, there are so many people out there right uh, who are you know that uh, they have to completely uh, bear this expense of medical expense and uh, uh, we find this thing as well. This World Bank, uh, World Health Organization says that 3.2% uh, of Indians would fall below the poverty line because of high out-of-pocket expenditure. Every year, we find 6 crore people, right? They are falling below poverty line. They are normal people. They are above poverty line. Not that doing that great. Some of them are doing great, but uh, depending on... Uh, health challenge or health issue of one of their family member uh, they have to sell their properties they have to sell their goals and savings and other things and they have to pay for this medical expenses and you know once things are all right as far as this medical expense uh, medical journey of uh, that particular patient is concerned once they step out of hospital they find that they are below poverty line because they have sold every possible thing that they used to have so six crore people every year so you can imagine right to six crore so next year six crore so it's 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 unsustainable figure right and we have to do something about it now government has came out with this Aishman Bharat scheme and I have a question based on this scheme for you guys so at the end of this discussion we'll talk about it I'll, I'll take you through the question but for now uh, expert estimation indicates that uh, to run this Ayushman Bharat scheme, you would need 25,000 crore per year. Now, the problem, the article is talking about get the model right. So, it's talking about this Ayushman Bharat scheme and what are a couple of flaws or a major flaw that we find with Ayushman Bharat. The major flaw is that, you know, insurance, we have this uh, private insurance companies are going to be part of this uh, Ayushman Bharat scheme. Now, uh, there are some salient features of Ayushman Bharat and because today it is part of your question, I'm not uh, throwing more light on this thing. So may, you have to do a little bit of research by yourself on this topic. This is a very important as well as famous topic. So it is something that has been there in various different news items. Uh, you know, we have talked about it as well many times. So I'm not repeating salient features it is your question so please 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 make sure that you go through some salient features of Aishman Bharat or Pradhan Madri Jan Arogya Yojana now the thing is uh, any insurance company right there are a few basic expenses like uh, you have to pay salaries and you have to look after your customers uh, then you have to you know uh, do advertisement marketing uh, then when you are impaneling these hospitals and so there are so many expenses associated with this uh, insurance business uh, 
for for all those private companies who are part of this insurance uh, sector now of course all these expenses will be covered from this final product uh, that is your policy so if you are selling a policy and whatever premium a person is paying will cover all these expenses isn't it now the thing is here when we talk about normal insurance company or let's take example of private insurance company that particular private insurance company will bear all the cost if if someone has insured himself or herself for one crore rupee for whatever for death or for medical illness and if that person falls ill then if the bill is 90 lakh rupee then this insurance company will have to bear that 90 lakh rupee right so here what we find is when government is deploying this uh, insurance companies just to you know sort out of these documents and checking and other things it is adding a layer of expense here because at the end of the day if someone is not well under this Ayushman Bharat scheme it is ultimately the government of India that is going to bear all these expenses so we don't need insurance companies because if we if we get rid of this insurance companies then we can save somewhere around 15 percent of total expenditure uh, and uh, the other thing is insurance companies will add more expense when we are adding them the other thing is even insurance companies are using business process outsourcing for so many things from claim to premier from you know from from passing this claim for uh, checkups and so many things there are various different uh, companies who are aiding this insurance giants uh, to 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 smoothly run their core business so government can if uh, government wants then we can have some bpos doing a uh, job for us but we should not add one more layer of expense that is insurance companies now we have third item and uh, this one is about aligning the triad it's about this uh, particular topic that we were talking about remember this Ghazi attack topic we're talking about I and S Arihant and uh, last time when we were talking about this topic we talked about uh, Cuba's missile crisis we talked about Cold War uh, right we talked about how uh, we talked about this famous incident uh, during this uh, Cuban missile crisis where uh, one USSR's uh, you know USSR's uh, officer was a bit aggressive and he thought because of lack of communication he thought that there is a state of war between USSR and USA and he was about to deploy nuclear weapons and at that point of time a person steps in and that person has been given with the award as well remember so today whatever we are going to discuss is going to be an add-on to already uh, to all those things that we have already discussed so INS Arihant India's first nuclear ballistic missile submarine is introduced it has completed its uh, you know patrol and uh, now we have to think about our defense capabilities because see it is it will add uh, some challenges as well uh, it's all not that smooth uh, the thing is there is a media report or there are a few media reports uh, that uh, if we are talking about uh, carrying nuclear missiles nuclear lead missiles on this INS Arihant and then the capacity of these missiles is 750 kilometers so as far as Pakistan is concerned right Pakistan is not that far from us so 750 kilometer is all right with Pakistan but it's not at all okay with China if we talk about China then China is having its own you know INS Arihan type of uh, uh, submarines and the capacity of uh, nuclear weapons or nuclear missiles that are carried by Chinese submarine is uh, 3000 kilometer plus right so it can easily target India uh, so still things are work in progress as far as our uh, deterrence is concerned there are a few people out there they are saying that this is a good step and there are people out there who are questioning this uh, you know INS Arihan's capabilities and missile capabilities and other things and they are not doing anything wrong Right. if someone is against or someone is supporting this thing then all we need is proper logical arguments right uh, that's that's the most important thing uh, when we talk about uh, this sort of issues now one SSBN with limited range is far from sufficient we need uh, more of them we just have one so with just one SSBN if we are celebrating then that's not going to help the other thing is it can push us uh, into a bit of more you know it will create this competition maritime competition in this region 
of Indian Ocean. We will find uh, then China, then Pakistan. Right, India is already going. The more Pakistan will have this sort of submarines, the more India will try to match up with. So it's going to create this maritime competition, which is very expensive. And uh, one more thing, the control of this type of missiles is completely in the hand of Navy or defense rather than it should be in the hands of our civil government. So when it comes to normal missiles that we can launch from surface or when we can launch from land portion, uh, these missiles can be controlled by civilian government. When it comes to air force, uh, that missiles can be, uh, you know, those missiles can be con uh, controlled by our our civilian government. But uh, when it comes to SSBNs, right, uh, they are very far and they are completely under the control of a Navy or Defense Forces. So civilian government cannot control these uh, things. Then sophisticated communication systems is something that is a must because you know, this whole USSR and USA crisis took place because of this lack of proper communication channels. And we don't want to see this sort of situation with our country. So, so far we have discussed uh, one, two and three articles, right? Now, this article is completely not useful for your examination. Neither is this one. We are going to stick with this one, Gandhiji opposed partition. Now, some of you may find it a bit difficult to digest that Gandhiji was against uh, this idea of partition because... There are rumors out there, you know, people out there, they have their own views and opinions. And uh, the sad thing is that I find many a times that students who are preparing for competitive exams, even they are not uh, deploying their logic and understanding and other things uh, when it comes to Gandhiji or when we talk about some other topics. Like yesterday we were talking about this uh, Brahminical patriarchy, remember? Uh, then when we were talking about this... Uh, Brahminical patriarchy, we were not referring to any caste, isn't it? Uh, I clearly said this thing that we are not talking about any particular caste, we are talking about one ideology. Just imagine if you find a question in your interview, if someone is asking you, uh, like, just let's, ex let's, you know, uh, take this hypothetical case, a Brahmin candidate uh, is there for UPSC interview and uh, if uh, you know, just a couple of days ago, you find this sort of, some sort of like Bhim Koregao uh, anniversary is there and uh, you are there for interview. And if, if this if one of the panel member will ask you this question, like what is Brahminical ideology? And then if you are talking about just one side, right? If you are just talking about this caste system and if you are not talking about these issues faced by uh, women, uh, then do you think your answer will be complete or uh, will it project a thorough understanding uh, of this topic? No. In the same way, when we talk about partition, you have to look at it from various different angles and uh, this is important for your, for your view formation, for your capacity building because in reality Gandhiji opposed partition until the very end. Uh, in 1946, he was completely sidelined by uh, Congress leadership, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru as well as Sardar Patel had uh, come to accept this idea of partition without even the courtesy of consulting Mahatma Gandhiji. Congress Working Committee accepted this Mountbatten's plan and to be precise in 1947, 3rd June 1947, Gandhiji told this line to Rajendra Prasad that I can see only evil in this plan of partition. Uh, a reporter asked uh, this question to Mahatma Gandhiji that uh, uh, is he going to <coughs> beg your pardon is he uh, going to undertake a fast to prevent this partition Gandhiji said that if the Congress commits uh, if a Congress if the Congress commits uh, to an act of madness does it mean I should die this are the words coming out from Gandhiji so here again we can see that he was not up with, he was not happy with this idea of partition. Secretary, State Secretary V.P. Menon, uh, you know, advised uh, Mr. Patel uh, to accept this partition or inevitability of partition and uh, this was later on accepted by Mr. Nehru as well. So Nehru was not happy with this idea that uh, Muslim League's members, when I say Muslim League, I'm not talking about Muslims, I'm talking about this political party called Muslim League, right? Ministers uh, representing people from Punjab and Bengal and, uh, you know, creating ruckus in 
in in this parliament so this was one of the reason why nehru was happy with this partition and uh, there were two leaders so both of them were muslims uh, abdul ghaffar khan and maulana azad both of them were totally against uh, this idea of partition uh, Ram, uh, rajendra prasad govind ballabh pant uh, all these leaders uh, favored uh, dividing the country and finally the blame is history has blamed mahatma gandhi ji Uh, for this uh, partition so here you have uh, a different view coming from uh, this uh, particular article so please help yourself with this thing and uh, if you have to then do read this article as many times as you like or fit uh, you know feel fit to read uh, that's everything in uh, articles now let's uh, go through some news items latest news india pakistan commit to kartarpur corridor kartarpur corridor is important one because it is this place uh, that is in pakistan where uh, guru nanak dev uh, spent uh, his uh, last few years of his life and uh, uh, the world is celebrating 550th birth anniversary of guru nanak dev so pakistan is ready to provide uh, visa free entry to to pilgrims uh, from india so this is a good step uh, cic has said that it has not been consulted on changes in rti act now government is trying to you know uh, fix the tenure as well as salaries of state and central information commissioners and this is taken as uh, you can say a sort of you know uh, it is taken as a direct control of government on this important post of cic now cic is supporting this rti you know one of the main body that is looking after rti and rti is not just about information it is about knowledge and it is about uh, you know vigilance so cic plays a very important role but when this sort of lack of consultation is there when this sort of attitude is been you know displayed by government then that is not healthy for our democracy as well as our institutions uh, rupee strengthens to 71 uh, with a softer oil fund flows or softer oil and fund flows do you view under trials prisoners as humans has been asked by supreme court to uh, government uh, shocked supreme court terms a state of forensic labs as utter chaos forensic labs uh, play a very important role in detecting crime and proving things and uh, this is very important for uh, for the court and smooth functioning of the court but when uh, for uh, this you know forensic labs are are empty when where, where you have big vacuums of vacancies then how can we run the show so that's a bit you know utter chaos is the word used by supreme court and supreme court is not happy with the state of our forensic labs no plan to reduce atms has been said by punjab national banks uh, this are your few vocabs now i have a map based quiz for you guys can you uh, give me some salient features of this uh, gibraltar and also tell me why it is in news you have to dig down a little bit in history and these are your answers of yesterday's question today's questions are on your screen that's everything in today's discussion thank you very much for your love and support and uh, I'm, i'm sure i'll be all right by tomorrow hopefully i'll be okay with by tomorrow as far as this cold cough and flu is concerned uh, thank you very much for your well wishes god bless you all jai hind